Our next little lecture is about long short-term memory or LSTM. There are extensions of backpropagation. The method um, first published by Seppolina Inma in 1970, extensions for supervised recurrent networks, not just feed-forward networks, but recurrent networks. And um, they are known as backpropagation through time. And there the um, recurrent network is unfolded into an FNN that has, into a feed-forward network that has essentially as many layers as there are time steps in the observed sequence of input vectors, which could be a speech signal. In speech, for example, you get uh, roughly 100 input vectors per second, every 10 milliseconds, a new um, input vector from the microphone. Now, the recurrent networks are general computers. The proof is very simple, because a few neurons can implement a NAND gate. A NAND gate and a net of NAND gates can emulate the microchip in your laptop. QED. But early recurrent networks couldn't learn deep problems, deep problems with long input sequences and long time intervals between uh, relevant uh, observations and relevant input events. In 1991, I first used unsupervised pre-training to overcome this um, problem. My uh, neural history compressor is a stack of recurrent networks and it works like this. A first recurrent network uses unsupervised learning just to predict its next input. For example, a se sequence of letter, uh, letters is coming in and it just tries to predict the next letter given the previous letters. And each higher level recurrent network tries to learn a compressed representation of the information in the recurrent network below. It's trying to minimize the description length or, in other words, the negative log probability of the data. And the way it is doing that, it is using predictive coding um, because the higher level network gets only the letters which were not predicted by the lower level network, and so on and so on. And the top recurrent network may then find it easy to classify the data by supervised learning, by downstream supervised learning. One can also distill the, the knowledge of the higher recurrent network, the teacher, into a lower recurrent network, call it the student, by forcing the lower RNN to predict the hidden units of the higher one, which is clocking on a slower time scale because it sees only the inputs that the recurrent network on the lower level was not able to predict. And uh, in the early 1990s, by 1993, such systems could solve previously unsolvable, very deep learning tasks involving over 1,000 subsequent computational stages, so problems of depth uh, greater than 1,000. So this worked great, but then came something that was even better, and uh, it worked without any unsupervised pre-training, and it has revolutionized sequence processing. That's the long short-term memory, or the LSTM. Recently, I learned that by the end of the 2010s, our 1997 LSTM paper got more citations uh, per year than any other computer, computer science paper of the 20th century. And I thought that is worth uh, being proud of.
LSTM or long short-term short memory overcomes the vanishing or exploding gradient problem or fundamental deep learning problem as I like to call it which was identified and analyzed by my first student ever by Sepp Hochreiter in 1991 in his diploma thesis and he um, realized that with standard activation functions, cumulative backpropagated error signals either shrink exponentially, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, exponentially in the number of layers or time steps in a recurrent network, or, which is just as bad, these um, error signals grow out of bounds. And in both cases, um, learning fails. And the problem is really most apparent in recurrent neural networks, which are the deepest of all neural networks. Now, LSTM is designed to overcome this uh, problem. And the first idea is already present in Sepp's thesis of 1991. I don't have time to explain LSTM in detail, but at least I can mention uh, the brilliant students in my lab who made it possible. First of all, Sepp, but also Felix Gears uh, with important contributions such as the forget gate, which is now the uh, essential ingredient and ins essential ingredient of the vanilla LSTM that everybody's using. Then Alex Graves, uh, who also had important contributions, and Dan Viestra and others. In 1997, compute was 100,000 times more expensive than today in, 2000, in 2020. But since 1941, when um, Konrad Zuse built the first working program control general computer, since then, every five years, compute got um, 10 times cheaper. And by 2009, Compute was so cheap that uh, my student Alex Graves was able to win, for the first time, competitions through deep learning, through long short-term memory. Um, that was about handwriting recognition back then, with long time lags and deep credit assignment paths. Um, but it was, pay it was possible to outperform all the competition. And by the 2010s, LSTM uh, and its implementations um, were cheap enough, um, computer was cheap enough to spread LSTM all over the planet on billions of smartphones. For example, since 2015, LSTM trained by our method called Connections Temporal Classification or CTC and Alex Graves was the first author on that. Um, published in 2006. This combination of CTC and LSTM uh, did Google's greatly improved speech recognition on billions of um, Android phones. And uh, our LSTM also was the core of the greatly improved Google Translate in 2016. So before 2016, the Chinese laughed about the translations from English to Chinese and back, uh, but not any longer um, afterwards. In fact, by 2016, over a quarter of the awesome computational uh, power for inference in all those Google data centers was used for LSTM. Facebook announced in 2017 that they are using LSTM to, to, trans to translate 30 billion messages per week. That's over 50,000 per second. LSTM also learned to improve Microsoft's um, software in several ways and Apple's Siri and QuickType on a billion iPhones. And it also learned to create the answers of Amazon's Alexa in 2016. So that's, uh, that's not a recording, it's a voice that is generated anew for every single case. The great companies from Asia, like Samsung, Alibaba, Tencent, and many others, are also using LSTM a lot. 
It is important to realize that LSTM can not only be trained by gradient descent but also by reinforcement learning without a teacher that shows on a training set how, what should be done. No, it can be trained by policy gradients to maximize reward in reinforcement learning as shown um, in 2007 to 2010 with my collaborators, including my PhD student Dan Wierstra um, and Jan Peters and Alexander Förster. Dan Wierstra later became employee number one of DeepMind, the co company uh, co-founded by Shane Legg another PhD student from my lab, from here, from the ITSEA. In fact, Shane and Dan were the first um, persons at DeepMind who uh, really had publications in AI and PhDs in computer science. Policy gradients for LSTM have become important. For example, in 2019, DeepMind beat a pro player in the video game of StarCraft, which is much harder than chess or Go in many ways. And DeepMind used a program called AlphaStar, whose brain essentially is a, a deep LSTM core trained by policy gradient methods. And uh, the famous OpenAI 5 program um, also learned to defeat human experts in the Dota 2 video game, which is a famous video game, Dota 2, that was in 2018. And again, the core of that uh, system was a policy gradient trained LSTM, which had 84% of the uh, model's total parameter count. So 84% of the parameters to be adjusted were the LSTM parameters. And Bill Gates himself called this a huge milestone in advancing AI.